Hi, it's good to be with you on this Thursday of the 21st week of Ordinary Time. My name is Dr. James Merrick. I'm the director of Emmaus Academic and the director of clergy support here at the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. Before we jump into today's reading, let me just remind you to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure that your notifications are enabled so that you can follow along with the content that we're providing. We're really excited about helping bring scripture to life to everyone. And if you're interested in going deeper into scripture, make sure that you're connected with us. All right, we're going to turn our attention uh, today to the gospel passage, uh, and it comes from the uh, end of uh, Matthew chapter four, uh, 24. And uh, this is a part of Matthew where uh, Jesus is on the Mountain of Olives, which is a range to the east of Jerusalem, known, of course, for olive trees. Uh, and it's just after Jesus has cleansed the temple and he's engaged in the temple authorities, about the authority that he has to do this. He's prophesied about the coming destruction of the temple. And then he's left with his apostles uh, and they've gone to the Mountain of Olives where he is going to now try to prepare them for the role that they're going to be taking on soon uh, after his crucifixion. So uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, see what we've got here. Um, Jesus had prophesied about a coming time of persecution and a time of kind of apocalyptic events, um, particularly the destruction of the temple, which of course did happen in 70 AD. Uh, where our reading comes in is when he's shifted from talking about what's going to come to how to get prepared, what you should be doing, what you should be focused on uh, in light of this coming uh, tragedy. And Jesus begins the passage that we're looking at today with a warning, a sort of exhortation. He says, watch therefore, uh, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. So be on the lookout, be ready, be watchful. Um, and it's important, I think, to say that what Jesus is asking them to do is not be focused on these terrible events, not getting so worried and concerned about what's going to happen to their beloved temple uh, and to their people. Uh, but to be focused rather on his return, on his coming again. Uh, and I think that's a, a good piece of advice for us because I think a lot of times when the world looks bad, when things are going wrong, when you know we start to hear talk about the end of the world or maybe even just the crash of the economy, we can get all worked up and focus on the events and watching the news and get sucked in and that becomes our focus. And the Lord tells us, no, focus on my coming again. Be focused on me. Do the things that I've asked you to do. So that, I think, is an important word of encouragement to us. Uh, right after he uh, warns them to be on the lookout for his return, he gives them a, a parable, as he often does. And let's just read it so that it's fresh in our minds. Hopefully, you've already had a chance to look at the readings for today, but let's uh, go over this one just so it's fresh in our minds. Jesus says this. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all of his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed, and he begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour that he does not know and will punish him and put him with the hypocrites. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. Now, we've got to keep in mind that Jesus tells this parable primarily to his apostles who again had followed him after the cleansing of the temple to the Mountain of Olives. They're kind of looking for some more instruction, for more information. What did you just do? What do you mean by saying the temple is going to be destroyed? Uh, so Jesus is speaking to his apostles, those who he is going to put into charge of his household, the church. And so this parable is about a master leaving his household in the charge of his servants. Uh, and it seems that Jesus is now speaking to those who he's going to put into charge. And it, Jesus is shifting from criticizing the existing servants of God's house, the religious authorities in the temple that he was just challenging and rebuking, to warning his new ministers to make sure they don't repeat the mistakes of these temple authorities. 
So this parable, again, is really aimed at the leaders of the church, the people we would call the clergy. And there still, of course, are some lessons for us lay folk, but primarily we got to keep in mind the audience of this parable. Uh, so what is Jesus saying to the clergy? And maybe it's helpful for us as we pray for the clergy to think about these things. Um, well, Jesus tells them that they should be focused on his return. They should be ready for him to return at any moment. That's the first thing that sets apart the faithful from the unfaithful servant. The faithful servant is ready and focused on the return of his master. Now, my wife and I have been blessed with six children. And from time to time, you know, we go out uh, for an evening and we have a babysitter. Uh, and uh, we've had different experiences with different babysitters, as maybe you have as well. Uh, sometimes, yeah, and actually quite frequently, we return home before we told the babysitter that we would, not for any kind of sinister reason, just, just because the night got done early, and so we come back. And it's very interesting to see the, the sort of maybe faithful babysitter versus the unfaithful babysitter, right? We've had uh, times we've walked through the door to find the babysitter on the phone, talking maybe to her boyfriend or something like that, kind of with a look on her face like, oh, I'm not ready for you. Uh, and we see that the kids have been put in front of a movie. They've been allowed to eat away from the dinner table. So there's crumbs everywhere. Their plates with half-eaten food are, you know, scattered about the house. You know, the basement is trash. There are toys everywhere. The dishes haven't been done. The house is in a state of disarray. Uh, and you can tell that, you know, she was kind of not prepared for us to arrive and that she was going to do a mad scramble to clean up, you know, just before we got, we were supposed to get home. And of course, we've had great experiences too, where we've come home and the babysitter is with the kids, maybe reading them, getting them ready for bed. The dishes have all been done. Dinner has been cleaned up. You know, everything is in good order, maybe even better order than what we left the house. So uh, I think this is a helpful illustration to think about, you know, two, di two different ways of, of, of approaching your responsibility. Um, are you ready for the master to return at any moment? Are you ready for the parents to come back? Or are you going to just sort of uh, let things go until the last minute? That's the crucial difference. The good servant is like that babysitter who's ready at any moment for the parents to return. You know, they've got the house in order. They're doing their responsibilities. They're keeping on top of things. They're not shirking their duties and using their, uh, you know, their, their master's absence uh, as a time for them to kind of do what they want to do. Um, now, before we turn our attention to the faithful and wise servant and what traits characterize that servant, uh, let's just look at how Jesus characterizes the unfaithful servant. Uh, so we're taking things a little bit out of order. Uh, Jesus suggests that the unfaithful servant treats the master's absence as an opportunity or an excuse to kind of indulge themselves, right? The master's away, so the mice will play kind of thing. Uh, they're going to treat the master's household like their own personal playground. They're going to use their master's goods for their own personal gain. Uh, so in the context of this passage, Jesus says that rather than feeding the master's family or, and the occupants of his household, they actually abuse them, all the while, quote unquote, eating and drinking with the drunkards, right? Um, so they re reject and uh, the, the people who are actually the master's people, and they go off and play with other people they find more interesting. Uh, clearly here we have an image of a servant, or again, thinking about Jesus's audience, a clergy person who resents those who have been left uh, in his charge. Um, we have a, a, a person who, rather than provide for the needs of the faithful, uh, attacks them when they ask to be fed, right? That's the kind of response they get. Oh, you know, don't ask me to do this. I don't want to be bothered with your request. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to care for your needs. That's the kind of attitude. Uh, so uh, the master's absence becomes an excuse for uh, the clergymen to do as they please. Um, and they spend their time cozying up with the wrong people, right? Not the, the people uh, who are in the master's household, but uh, those who likewise don't care about when the master is going to return. That's not their concern. Uh, the, you know, elsewhere in the scripture, we hear about the worldly people or the wicked people. That's the drunkards, the people who are, are uh, you know, not concerned about the things of God. Um, so you can see that the unfaithful servant uh, or the unfaithful clergyman uh, is someone who decides to give up on their responsibilities and focus instead uh, on trying to be accepted uh, and to live like those who are outside the master's household. 
The faithful servant, by contrast, keeps the house in order. That's where his heart is. His heart is in his master's house, right? Uh, and he is also aware that at any moment his master can return. So he wants to be found being faithful. He wants to be found doing his duty. Um, and Jesus describes the faithful servant uh, as feeding the people uh, in, uh, in their time of need, right? Uh, he takes care, for, uh, care of and provides for the needs of the people in the master's house. Um, clearly, this means the clergy should feed the faithful with the Lord's food. Uh, in other words, they should teach the scriptures, they should preach good homilies, they should catechize those in their care in the church doctrine. Uh, they should carefully administer the sacraments, principally the Eucharist, taking care to make sure that those who receive it are, are doing so in a manner in which they can actually be nourished, right? In, in a state of grace, in other words. Um, they should conduct themselves virtuously and honorably, um, being an example and inspiration to the faithful, not a stumbling block. Now, as we reflect on this parable, we probably have in mind uh, clergy uh, who are more like the faithful servant and those who are more like the unfaithful servant. You know, we probably experience some clergy who uh, are more like the unfaithful servant in that they resent their religious work. They don't like it. They don't seem to be very fond of it. They, they um, seem like they would rather be doing something else that's more interesting or more acceptable to the world at large. You know, maybe they don't give a lot of time to their homilies and you can tell that it's just something that they've kind of come up with quickly. They rush through the mass almost like it's an embarrassment, right? They seem eager to get it over. They're annoyed with people who ask them, say, if they can use a room in the parish to have a Bible study or if, if we can do some sort of event at the church or, or maybe that we can have more opportunity for Eucharistic adoration. They shut down those things really quickly and kind of uh, angrily. Um, and they maybe try to run the Lord's house like it was just any other uh, thing in the world. Um, but hopefully we also have had good experiences with clergy. Hopefully we also know some who are more like the faithful stu uh, steward, those who pour themselves out in feeding the Lord's people, uh, who emphasize catechesis, who are good preachers, and who carefully administer the sacraments. So as we meditate on Jesus' words here in Matthew 24 at the Mountain of Olives, uh, let's first give thanks for those faithful clergy who are doing what they can uh, to feed the Lord's people, to manage his household well, to be good servants. Uh, and let's also pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons that they would be like the faithful servant uh, and not give in to the temptation to be like the unfaithful servant. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, here at the St. Paul Center, we're very excited about bringing the scriptures to life for all the faithful. And so make sure that you're subscribed to our channel and that you're following us on social media so that you can find more great content that helps you understand the riches of the Word of God.